an introduction to this evening. Um, we didn't realise when we arranged this event that we'd be doing it a day after the Jewish Leadership Council, the Board of Deputies met with Jeremy Corbyn. Um, neither did we really know exactly sort of what was going to happen in the few weeks before. This date was set quite a long time ago. Um, and I think the reason why that is, and it's really an introduction to our speakers, I mean, BICOM and Fathom um, have been writing about uh, these issues, about the left's obsession with Israel, uh, about anti-Zionism and how that sort of becomes a dangerous kind of anti-Semitism for a long time. And, and, and uh, my, my first speaker, um, Professor Alan Johnson, who's the editor of Fathom Journal, has been writing about um, what he calls uh, anti-Semitic anti-Zionism uh, well before it was cool to be writing about it. Before it hit the zeitgeist, when Jeremy Corbyn was leader of Labour Party, he was writing about it long before. And uh, when this all started to build up ahead of steam in 2016, um, he was one of the key people that was writing about it and, and was doing media interviews and uh, was in great demand. Um, and uh, his works um, are too numerous to mention, but I mean, if you do want to go into more detail about all of this and look at some of the stuff he's written, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, it's worth reading on Fathom Journal. Um, but um, yeah, so Alan is, a, is our first speaker. Um, uh, on the left, um, uh, is Luke Akehurst, who's the director of We Believe in Israel. Um, he's been a Labour Party activist for... Exactly 30 years. Exactly 30 years. Um, he uh, was a member of the Labour NEC, um, uh, been a councillor in the Labour Party, and he's head of something called Labour First uh, within the Labour Party. So he's steeped in all the organs, institutions, ideologies of the Labour Party. So I can't think of two better people um, to really be talking about this issue. Um, we, we really build it as talking about why is the left so obsessed with Israel. I'm, I'm aware that at some point we're going to start also talking about the anti-Semitism issue, but I should say at the outset, we are not the lead people who are dealing with all the stuff that's going on at the moment by any means. It's being dealt with by the Jewish Leadership Council, the Board of Deputies, rather well. And yes, of course, we'll talk about it, but I just should say that we're not. We're not the ones kind of leading, leading, leading that particular issue. But what I want to do is um, I'm going to ask Alan to say a few words and then Luke to say a few words and I'll sort of interact with him a little bit and then really want to move into questions um, and hear from you. Um, and we want to finish uh, by 8.30 um, so you can all sort of have the rest of our evenings. But without further ado, I want to, I want to hand over to... To Alan, just give him a chance to have a sip. But uh, yeah, over to you. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Uh, James mentioned some of my works. This this is one that I'm particularly proud of. It's a leaflet that I ran off in a stenciled machine in about 1985, <laughs> when I was a lot younger, and it was a meeting at Liverpool Trade Union Centre, which who knows, Len McCluskey could even have been there. <laughs> and the leaflet is left wing anti Semitism, myth or reality. So when anyone tells you that this is a new phenomena to do with smearing Jeremy, remember that, that we were there 30 years ago having these arguments. UJS were there 30 years ago having these same arguments. So 30 years of an argument, maybe five or six minutes to, to, to say something about it. A couple of preliminary comments. You know, I'd say as someone on the left, um, everything I learned about what's wrong with parts of the left I learned from another part of the left. Um, so don't get the impression that the entire left is as bad as, um, as, as some of its representatives. Secondly, I guess tonight we're gonna try and dig a bit deeper and explain the left's hostility to Israel rather than, uh, certainly in these opening remarks, look at individual cases. Um, I think there's three aspects we need to look at when we talk about the problem. One is we need to say something about Israel and the conflict. Secondly, we need to say something about an ideology that dominates the left, which I will call campism, which I'll explain. Anti-Westernism might be another term for it. And the third aspect is, is a tradition, left-wing anti-Semitism. That might come out in the Q&A. So three things, and the way that they mingle together has created the kind of perfect storm we're dealing with now. On Israel, about five years ago, I was in INSS, a think tank in Tel Aviv, leading a seminar. And I was asked by an Israeli, why do you think the left in the UK is so hostile to Israel? And I said, well, look, I've got a very long, complicated answer. But where I'd like to start is with a two-word answer, which is the occupation. And at the end of the table, Emily Landau, who is an expert on the Iranian nuclear threat, a fierce Zionist, looked down at me and she went like that, silent applause. Now, what was I getting at? What was she getting at? I think if you want to understand the left, 
and then engage with it and argue with it. You have to understand that for a good part of the left, it thinks that its core values are contradicted by a lot of what it sees and how it sees we're going to come on to in Israel. So it thinks of itself as fiercely for human rights and it sees a 50 year occupation. It thinks of itself as anti-colonial, it sees settlements. It thinks of itself as anti-racist and it looks at a prime minister who says um, Arabs are coming in droves to the polls. It thinks of itself as anti-militarist and then it has a particular view of the Gaza conflicts. It thinks of itself as anti-nationalist. It drew the conclusion from the Second World War that we needed to go away from nationalism, away from nation states towards internationalism and even supranationalism. <clears throat> For obvious reasons, most Jews around the world took the opposite view, which is that we need a nation state, we needed to have ramparts, we need the IDF on those ramparts, and we need to defend ourselves. That was So really opposite conclusions were drawn. So there's always going to be an issue, take aside Corbyn, left-wing anti-Semitism and so on, there's going to be an issue between the left and, and Israel. Now, maybe you had two thoughts when I was going through that list. Both of them, I think, would be good thoughts. One, you might have been thinking, God, that's a really simplistic view that the left has of, of Israel. Um, it's one-sided, it's simplistic. That's a good thought. You may have also been thinking, God, the left's inconsistent. How come it's so hostile on all those measures to Israel, but when it comes to Putin or Assad or Hamas or Hezbollah, it doesn't follow through? Why is it just Israel that those values seem to kind of bash into? So I think they're both good thoughts, and if you follow them through, you get towards where some of the, the deeper roots of the left's problem is. See, when we look at Israel, I think we see complexity, we see contradiction, we see the tragic in some ways. We see Israeli offers for peace that were spurned. We see Palestinian decisions to launch a second intifada and suicide bombings. We know that it's a very complicated, tragic, unresolved national question between two peoples. We know that the last inch of the deal is a, the last inch we need to go to make the deal is a mile deep, as it said. We, we see all of that. And we know that the Palestinian decisions have meant that for a lot of Israelis, the old notion of land for peace is incredible to them. So it's very difficult to make progress in the peace process for all sorts of very good reasons. So we see all of that. Question, why don't the left? Why don't the left see any of that complexity? Why do they see something that's almost cartoon-like in its simplicity and its crudity when they look at Israel? That takes us, I think, into the second area we need to look at. This, the left has been guided for many decades by a very simplistic, very crude ideology, a set of ideas or a worldview that kind of erases complexity, has no space for contradiction, no, no space for a grey area. It's, it's some, I call it campism, that the, the whole world is divided into two camps. Other people call it, fancy word, occidentalism or anti-westernism. Some people, Majid Nawaz calls it the regressive left. Nick Cohen calls it the left that's lost its way. It, it's all the same idea, really, and what is that idea? I thought I could talk to you in theoretical terms about this ideology, but you know what, let's just hear it. And if you hear it, you get a real feel for it. I've got some quotes for you, for, forgive me. So this is, this is what this worldview of campism leads to. Four quotations. First quotation, leading, possibly the leading socialist, feminist, academic in America called Judith Butler. Listen to this. Understanding that Hamas and Hezbollah as social movements are progressive, are on the left, are part of the global left, is really extremely important. <laughs> yeah? Okay, so we're dealing with something that is delusional, um, it's turning the world upside down, it's meaning that our political positions and our analysis are going to be completely skewed. Um, second quotation, Jeremy Corbyn. Hezbollah is an organization that's bringing long-term peace and social justice and political justice in the whole region. <laughs> that, that's presumably when it's not starving uh, Syrians because it's got a siege around various cities on behalf of Assad. Literally starving people inside those cities because it's, it's the organization implementing the siege. Or, or blowing up Jewish community centers in Argentina, etc., etc. Kind of madness, then. A kind of madness flows from this ideology. Third, John Rees, leader of the Stop the War movement. Who, by the way, when he's not talking about this stuff, can be brilliant. About the levelers, he's written this fantastic book about the levelers in the 17th century revolution. So we're not talking about idiots. We're not talking about low-level neophytes who just joined the movement five minutes ago. These are the, the intellectuals of the movement. This is John Rees. 
He's talking about the Iraq war by Saddam Hussein and so on. Socialists should unconditionally stand with the oppressed <clears throat> against the oppressor. Even if the people who run the oppressed country are undemocratic and persecute minorities like Saddam Hussein. Okay, so now we're with the <laughs> now we're with Saddam. Okay, the, the gasser of the Kurds. Um, you know, the, the, the killer of the Marsh Arabs in, in huge numbers, torturer. Last quotation, and then I'll move on. Leading Marxist intellectual in Britain, um, John Molyneux, um, talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. To put the matter as starkly as possible, an illiterate, conservative, superstitious, Muslim, Palestinian peasant who supports Hamas is more progressive than an educated, liberal, atheist Israeli who supports Zionism, even critically. Okay, so what, what are we dealing with then? We're dealing with something that is very crude. Uh, it deals in binary oppositions. The whole world is shrunk and simplified to these binary oppositions, good and bad, oppressed and oppressor. The denial of truth. If the truth contradicts that dogma, it tends to be denied. Assad, Putin, and so on. Cynicism, they're not stupid people. They know who bombed in Syria. They know what happened in, in Salisbury. So you start twisting and manipulating and instrumentalizing the truth so you don't have to face up to it. And you, you do that quite cynically and pass that on to, to your constituency. You become an apologist for tyranny. You adopt the expression of my enemy's enemy is my friend. So gay people can be abandoned. Women can be abandoned. Workers and trade unions can be abandoned. The Marsh Arabs can be abandoned. All the core values that the left should have, freedom, democracy, sexual gender liberation, all those things can go by the by. The only thing that matters is this crude view that the world is divided into imperialist and imperialized, oppressed and oppressors, and every issue is very simply understood. Lack of empathy for Jewish victims. That's also part of it. We see it on a big scale and a small scale. I mean, on one, one scale, when four uh, Jews were killed in Paris, uh, the Liberal Democrat uh, at the time, um, Ward, um, tweeted, Je suis Palestinian. What? Four Jews are killed in Paris and you tweet, Je suis Palestinian? What, what, what's that about? Um, in, in short, the left loses the ability to distinguish between the fascistic and the progressive. It's that bad. It cannot clearly distinguish anymore between the fascistic and the progressive. So it's, a, it's terrible. How does this campus and frame Israel then? Israel is, is in two big ways. This ideology, this simplistic ideology, frames, in, in both, all senses of that word, frames Israel. Israel is at the heart of the imperialist power around the world. At its worst, it's the hyper-imperialism, the kind of brain of the, of the imperialist world. Anyone, therefore, shooting at Israelis is to be supported as the resistance, as the oppressed. There's a kind of comprehensive hostility almost all of world Jewry and to Israel as a state beyond the pale within that ideology. The second thing is, and um, a little bit more and then, then I'll, I'll move over. The second point is that the left has real struggle recognizing Israel's right to national self-determination, uh, the Jewish people's right to national self-determination. Why? And it, I'm going to do a bit of history, but it's really important, I think, to understand this. For me, I think it's the crux. And if you can persuade left-wingers of this, by the way, and get them to think it through, it's where you win them over. The left used to have a position in the 19th century, in the early 20th, that you fought anti-Semitism through assimilation and universalism. The world revolution, socialism and the world revolution was going to burn away all sorts of problems, all sorts of oppressions, and it was going to burn away anti-Semitism in the process. In many ways, a noble idea. How did world history actually go? World history went failure of the socialist revolution, rise of fascism, rise of <coughs> Nazism, a radicalization of anti-Semitism in the middle of Europe, in the middle of the 20th century that produced the Shoah. And then if you want to add into that the collapse of the Russian revolution itself into anti-Stalinism, the mass expulsions of the Jews from the Arab world, you can add that all in together. That is the hinge in world history that meant that what, what most Jewish people around the world did, all bar a sliver really, is to say we are going to participate in the modern world through a, the choice of a Jewish homeland, a nation state amongst other nation states <coughs> in Palestine. That's our choice. That's our response to that hinge in world history and the way that history went. The left did not get the memo. 
The left did not adapt itself to that change, that rupture in world history. It doubled down on its old program. So now, the meaning of so-called anti-Zionism completely transformed. Before the Holocaust, before the establishment of the State of Israel, anti-Zionism was mostly an argument amongst Jews about how to fight anti-Semitism. Do you set up a new state? Do you fight where you are? Mostly it was an argument amongst Jews. After the Holocaust, after the creation of the State of Israel, the political meaning of anti-Zionism is completely transformed. It's completely. It now means the denial of and the program of the, for the abolition of actually existing Jewish self-determination, an actually existing state of millions of people. And it means comprehensive hostility to almost all um, of world Jewry. So in those regards, it's, um, it's been a disaster. Now, I, I've been speaking too long. I think there's a, the third element is left-wing anti-Semitism. And I think that blends in with the campism and the campism itself constructs and frames what's going on in Israel. But I think that's all part of it. But I'm aware that, you know, there's lots of questions we want to get in and, and I could, could talk yeah. longer, but I'm sure Luke will, will, um, will take it from here. So. Thank you, Alan. That's a, a really brilliant introduction, which has hopefully uh, set all our minds racing in terms of just trying to understand how you how you get to this kind of situation and and, and why it's, I suppose, no surprise that you know if if, if Jeremy Corbyn is um, somebody who spent so many years in that kind of mindset, that why he does what he does, uh, why he gives a conference speech where he only mentions three countries: the U.S., Saudi Arabia, and Israel. Um, and uh, you know why there is this you know absolute uh, uh, obsession, and even within I think the current sort of situation with anti-Semitism, there's still this block I think when it comes to talking about Israel um, and talking about Zionism. But um, we'll, we'll 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 now go into a bit more of the of the detail of with sort of taking the theoretical analysis from from Alan, and then taking that into into Luke's worldview, which is sort of how does that then affect the, the, the actual institutions of the Labour Party at the moment? How, how is the Labour Party then affected by all of that? And, and what's changing and what does it mean? Okay. So, over to yeah. you, so, so I guess the, the thing that I, I, I need to start by explaining is this, this didn't all start in 2015. It uh, became uh, uh, more of a, a crisis situation for people that are on our side of the, uh, the argument came to a head in 2015 with the with, Jeremy Corbyn's election and the events since then, but the direction of travel in terms of the left or the centre-left's uh, attitudes to, and specifically the Labour Party's attitudes towards Israel was already um, not 100% um, positive. And uh, I think that um, as well as the set of people that Alan has talked to, who are, I describe them uh, as being stuck in a 1917 paradigm that you have conversations with people and it is literally like they're having the debate that people in the Jewish community in Poland or Russia were probably having in 1917 about should we be Zionists or should we be Bundists? Seriously, I meet people that talk about is Bundism where the Jewish community should go or, uh, or should we be Bolsheviks or Mensheviks and they talk about that as though it's all incredibly real and that nothing that has happened since then in terms of Jewish history or world history uh, has, has happened. The thinking that was around in 1917 is, ha is how, you, uh, how you decide what you're going to do in, um, in, in 2018. Um, so there's a, a, a small set of people that are now powerful within the Labour Party uh, who already had very, very set views, uh, almost very ideological views. But the great mass of people that were already members um, before 2015, members, members of the Labour Party who are not so ideologically schooled, I think their thinking is shaped uh, by two wars. So first of all, the 1967 war between Israel and its Arab neighbours, which flips the, uh, the, the positioning within the Labour Party about who the underdog is. So the left wing of the Labour Party, people like Foot and Bevan, had been very pro-Zionist because they're seen as this little beleaguered Jewish socialist state, and then suddenly it's incredibly powerful and it's grabbed loads of land and the Palestinians start looking like the underdog and you get a shift globally and in Labour Party circles. And suddenly the, the people that have been the most vociferous Zionists on the, uh, I guess you, the, the, the Tribunite Labour left, the kind of Bevan and Foot tradition start uh, finding it problematic. 
And then another war that is not really to do with Israel at all, but is to do with how British people on the centre left perceive themselves is hugely important, which is, is, is the Iraq war in 2003, uh, which really um, is the defining moment for, 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 for people on, on, on the left in Britain about how they feel about uh, British and American foreign policy, uh, how they feel about the Muslim world, and uh, their distaste for what their own country did in terms of uh, in, in, in terms of the Iraq War, is kind of projected out onto the Israelis. So they don't look at Israel uh, being beleaguered and defending itself. They think it's a bunch of white people like us who are non-Muslims being horrible to a bunch of Muslims, and it's a replay of what Tony Blair and George Bush did, and therefore uh, we, we we shouldn't like it. And that's just the kind of yeah. This isn't what the uh, ideologues are saying. It's just the, the you know people around uh, the dinner party set or undergraduates uh, chatting to each other. It, 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 it's how they view the world, and the model of the inside of the Labour Party pre pre twenty fifteen is you probably have swing voters out there near the centre. The party leadership are, are a little bit uh, uh, to the left of them. The MPs are a little bit to the left of the party leadership. And the activists and members are even more left-wing than that and, are, and quite a long way uh, fr fr from uh, swing voters. That's obviously been turned on its head now because the, you now have a leadership that is aligned with where the activists are and to the left of the MPs, probably for the first time in Labour Party history. But in that pre-2015 um, model, it's all about managing the party, managing the internal democracy or lack thereof of the Labour Party to stop the Labour Party's um, on paper quite democratic policy making structures from coming up with things in to, and putting them into the manifesto that the leadership perceives would lose elections. So if there had been a vote at Labour Party conference on nationalising various industries, it would have got passed even at the height of Tony Blair's powers but it's managed so there's no vote taken on that stuff. If there's a vote taken on unilateral disarmament, it would have got passed even at the height of Tony Blair's powers, but it's managed so there isn't a vote taken at Labour Party conference. And if there is a vote, I, I, I guess, what would the vote be on Israel? It would probably be, should there be some form of boycott? So I don't think there was a majority for like one state. I think there was a majority for two states, but there was probably an openness to, 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 to boycott. If, there'd been a, uh, if, the, if the leadership had allowed that kind of a vote to take place, it would have been lost. It particularly would have been lost because the unions have half the votes. They're now back in their traditional position. The unions have traditionally been the, set, the, the, the grown ups in the room in the Labour Party, the more moderate wing compared to the activists. And they're back there now, but in the pre Corbyn period, they were to the left of the party leadership in terms of attitude to Israel and adopting boycott policies. The unions already already have some kind of boycott policy, even if it's just a settlement boycott, but sometimes a full boycott policy. Why did that happen? Because they were already under... Unions are not just composed of Labour Party members. They have people from more left-wing parties who are intensely involved in the structures of the unions. Uh, particularly the Socialist Workers' Party is good at getting its people to become very active in trade unions. And the Communist Party of Britain, which is irrelevant electorally, it's the kind of Stalinist rump of the old CP, very, very good at industrial stuff. If you want to win a strike, you ask a communist to organise it. So they're very involved in, in, in the union structure and hold quite high positions. And they'd already managed to switch um, trade union positions in, in, in favour of boycotts. Um, what happened um, in 2015 is that Ed Miliband had been... in. in completely miscalculated. He wanted to break the power of the unions in terms of hold, stopping him from uh, going where he wanted to in policy terms. Uh, he found, felt very intimidated by both Unite and the GMB. So he introduced this, you can join the Labour Party for free quid and vote in a kind of primary for its leader, <coughs> thinking that the great middle of the road middle classes of Britain would all join up. And in fact, they didn't pay free quid. The people that joined up were people that were on email lists and the left uh, had been, because it hadn't had any power in the Labour Party under Blair and Brown, the, uh, the, the left had been off engaging in single issue campaigns trying to build some kind of social movement, some kind of issue based campaign movement, trying to sustain itself during 30 years in the wilderness in single issue campaigns. 
Two of those campaigns are very much orientated towards uh, the Palestinians in the Middle East. So Palestine Solidarity Campaign, of which Jeremy Corbyn was the patron, and Stop the War Coalition, of which he was the, the president, was that the chairman, uh, chairman sorry? And um, they had built up very big email lists, partly because of stuff that was going on in Israel. So the, the Gaza War, in 2014, a hun about 100,000 people sent emails to their MPs because there was great technology for doing that, that they were about a year ahead of pro-Israel campaigners on it. And once people have sent those emails, the Palestine Solidarity Campaign was able to communicate with them again. So it just shot out an email during the, 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 during the, the leadership campaign. The guy that had run IT for the Palestine Solidarity Campaign became the head of IT for the Jeremy Corbyn campaign and then with his other hat on, sends an email to 100,000 people saying, click here, pay three pounds, you could make our patron, the leader of the Labour Party, what quicker way would there be to shift Labour Party policy on this? Something similar would have happened at the Stop the War Coalition. So there's a direct causal link between single issue campaigns around Palis the Palestinians bringing in large numbers of people who, uh, who, who voted in the Labour Party, and then that change in composition of the membership uh, and I'll come to, to, to close here on what I'm going to say, has, has accelerated since then because uh, the, the, the morale of the people on, on, on the wing of the party I identify with has been broken because the whole point of being on the moderate wing of the Labour Party is you think you're, the, yeah, you're always the leadership and the hard left are always the cranky people at the back of the, uh, of the local constituency party saying annoying things. What then happens is they are the parliamentary candidate and the people working in the leader's office and the people running the constituency. A lot of people, uh, some of them feel morally disgusted and have walked away. Others of them just, uh, yeah, it's too much to cope with. And more and more people who are uh, infused by Corbyn's worldview, not just on Palestine, but on anti-austerity and a whole load of other stuff, uh, and were very turned off by Tony Blair's approach to managing the party into policy, have come in so it's it's almost like the thing has been turned on its head uh, there's that great disaster movie where the ship turns over and people have to get out through the bottom it's like the labor party has become like that that the that what was the the people on the bridge are now down at the bottom and the people that were in the engine room uh, are, are, are up at the top i think that that's uh, all that i should uh, say at, at, at this one but that's the mechanics of how this has got into a bad place just to say the weird thing is, maybe in order to just not fight on too many fronts, maybe because they've been too busy firefighting on the, on the anti-Semitism uh, anti allegations, there has been no effort yet to switch the Labour Party policy on this. So the Labour Party policy now is the same as the Labour Party policy was um, under Ed Miliband. It's uh, the uh, no BDS at all and a two-state solution but with this Ed Miliband twist to it, which was uh, with, it, uh, with unilateral recognition of the Palestinian state uh, at the s immediately before the, uh, before the negotiation process. And the manifesto at the last general election said the same, same thing almost word for word as the, as the manifesto in 2015. What could change if, if, there was, if there was going to be a vote on any of this at a Labour Party conference to change policy would be, I think, settlement boycott is certainly an option that gets talked about by Labour friends of Palestine in the Middle East and uh, by people who are a lot more moderate than, than the people Alan's been talking about. You know, someone like Lisa Nandy that's really good on mm. anti-Semitism would be in favour of a settlement boycott and she might also be in favour of an arms embargo and the Labour Party already has a policy of an arms embargo on Saudi Arabia so adopting one on Israel I don't think would be a huge ideological shift. Mm. Thank you Luke, fascinating. Um, I just a few things that I want to just explore from from what you've said, and then and then we'll get into Q and A. And I think we should we should try and keep answers really really short, so we, we can keep it really really uh, simple and snappy. I mean, the first thing I, I, I just wanted to just tease out is this this obsession with Israel um, as you know the biggest problem in international affairs at the moment. I mean, what what, what do we see that? absolutely front and centre at the moment? Is, is, it, is it really current? I mean, uh, the thing that I wanted to explore a bit was the thing that we discussed this week. So, 
you know, you've got a situation on the Gaza border, <clears throat> and Jeremy Corbyn tweets that, you know, it's an outrage, and uh, he knows exactly who's to blame. Um, and uh, he's got no doubt whatsoever. Um, but when it comes to uh, children being gassed in Syria, uh, he needs the UN, uh, he needs a full investigation, uh, he's not blaming anyone. Um, uh, and it, for me, that was one of the most stark kind of contrasts between the two. And that sort of really brings out what Sir Vanden saying around the themes of like, okay, if you are obsessed with this idea that Israel is at the centre of everything that's wrong in the world, you can do that. So, just very quick reflections on that. Start with you. I, I, I'm not so sure, sure that it's all Israel. I think it's 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 a perception that the West yeah. is at the root of everything that's wrong in the world. So. Uh, Syria is seen through that framework, and, and Israel is seen as like an extension of right. British and American. So if America foreign, so Afghanistan, yeah, be, I think mean, it'd be equally yeah. worked up if America right. or, or if America was nasty to to, to a Latin American uh, tyranny. Yeah, if America got nasty with Cuba or Venezuela <laughs> or whatever, they'd be yeah. um, e equally un, un, unhappy. So so there are some there are people in in the I'll call it the anti-Israel movement who are completely fixated with Israel and Jews and that's where the the, 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 the anti-Semitic discourse comes in but I think the the wider group of people they just don't like uh, that they think they think the West are, are the bad guys and they yeah. include Britain in yeah. that um, I, I think some of the obsession is to do with things that are, are very little to do with the left in the sense of you know it's the Holy Land three world religions mm -hmm. Inside their strategic value to the grip, power as always has been, Jews are a spectacle for the world's consumption. This is just true. Um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is media friendly in terms of journalists can go there and, and be reasonably comfortable as they report a kinetic conflict going on around them, which is it's good copy. Um, I think there's one other thing I'd mention, which is my expression for it is um, what parts of the left do is decontextualize to demonize decontextualize to demonize so if you start talking about Gaza you you decontextualize it by omitting Hamas uh, Palestinian Islamic Jihad the nature of Hamas the Hamas charter that begins Islam will obliterate Israel pretty clear um, and so on and you just focus upon Israel's reaction to the rockets that's decontextualizing to demonize if you talk about 67 you don't talk about uh, the speeches and the bloodthirsty speeches and driving the Jews into the sea and the build-up of uh, the Arab armies and the removal of the UN, you mm -hmm. just talk about Israel's reaction mm -hmm. and therefore it appears as an expansionary war by the imperialist mm -hmm. power and so on. Mm -hmm. If you talk about 1948, you decontextualize by saying nothing about the acceptance of the UN resolution, the um, refusal of that on the part of the, um, the, the, the Palestinians, the invasion of the Arab armies, you only talk about 48 as a kind of land grab by Israel. So I find this on campuses wherever I go, decontextualizing to demonize. So a lot of what we have to do is simply know the facts and calmly and carefully explain them. It doesn't mean that you reach a position where Israel's perfect and everyone becomes a Zionist and so on. It just means that you, you draw people into a much more complicated, much more realistic conversation if you, if you can get them to contextualize this stuff. Mm. The, my other thing I just want to do, explore a little bit, and then we'll do questions, is just this idea of, um, so will, will sort of kind of people we're talking about ever really come to terms with, with Jewish national self-determination? So will, will there ever be a point where they say, you know what, I can live with this kind of Zionism? And, and I ask the question because, you know, I think, you know, I think even in the meeting um, yesterday with Jeremy Corbyn, where there was some discussion of Israel and and I think there was a bit where Corbyn sort of says, you know, we're in favour of the two-state solution and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, doing his bit about recognising Israel. And, and, and I just cast my mind back slightly to the experience when Netanyahu was in government between 96 and 99, and everyone was very anti-Netanyahu, he's the devil, he's terrible, you know, he's, he's not Rabin or Perez, it's awful. Uh, Hood Barak comes into power, um, he says he's going to do the deal with the Palestinians, he's going to give them a state, he's going to leave the Golan Heights, he's going he's gonna to do everything, he's going to leave Lebanon, and he starts to do it all, and then, you know, people were still, these kind of people were still deeply unhappy and uncomfortable with everything that he stood for and every, the Israel that he was about. So the question is kind of, you know, if there was this kind of, you know, rabbinical spiritual figure who has become Prime Minister of Israel tomorrow, who's, who will do everything for peace with the Palestinians, who will do everything that, you know, people have been saying they want an Israeli leader to do, will that actually be a point where they will still say, ah, oh, but... 
1948 we did this, or in 1924, and so I'm sorry, but, you know, is, is that a, will there ever be an accommodation? Yeah. Well, it's, it's different for different people. Like some people, I, I think, Alan, you talk about the 67 case, do you call it, in the 48 case? <laughs> the is file, that the, yeah. the file that some people, their big gripe is 67 and the occupation of the West Bank, yeah. and they would be satisfied by the creation of a Palestinian state uh, there. And, and, and others, it's it, it, 1948 is a kind of original sin, you know, yeah. the sin of the creation, and they buy into, uh, you know, the Nakba was the most terrible thing that... Uh, that, that that ever happened and then a, a lot of people on the British left and I don't think this is like the, the real out there left this is just just middle of the middle of the road center left people can't get their heads round the idea of the necessity of, of of a Jewish state so as soon as you start saying Jewish state they think that means a theocracy they don't really understand what Jewish means they don't they, they don't know that it, they understand the concept of peoplehood they assume it must mean a, a kind of race based thing or a theocratic uh, religious thing uh, so I think most of them will kind of go oh well I better tick the box about two states because I everyone's telling me that that's now the current thing I've got to tick but they probably don't accept that the that Israel in a two state solution is going to be uh, a Jewish state. Uh, and it's two states for two peoples. I kind of think they probably think mm. it's like a halfway house where eventually, you know, you'd have the right of return, and eventually mm. Israel might end up with a uh, an Arab majority oh, as well. Okay. How the, the other th key thing to understand is is, is that the um, the people around Corbyn keep praying in aid very small or minority groups of Jews. Uh, and presenting them as though they're like half the community and I think they act, they've actually come to believe that because that's the people that they chat to so the, the going to the, the Judas Seder I think he probably thinks that Judas is like as big as the United Synagogue or the reform movement um, the talking to the Jewish voice for labor or free speech on Israel all the time I think the people around Corbyn probably think that they are as significant players in communal life as as the JLM, and then you have Diane Abbott doing this kind of weird speech where, I mean, I, I like the Haredim, I was a Hackney councillor for uh, for 12 years, so I know all about the issues they face, but it was very odd that she goes on and on about the Haredim in a speech that's about uh, left-wing left anti-Semitism in the debate uh, in Parliament, because they keep trying to find these sets of Jews that say to them, I don't like Israel, and then in their mind's eye, they're, that, that again, it's back in the 1917 framework of the community being split down the middle and only half Zionist. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks Luke. Um, in, in, in two sentences, my experience is that you can win left-wing people over to a much more realistic view if you can get about two hours with them. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> if you can get a whole student, if you can fill a lecture hall and you get two hours of argument, you, you can win a lot of people over. Um, and the only other thing I'd add is... Dennis Prager didn't. Sorry? Dennis Prager couldn't. Right. The Oxford Union, did he? Okay, no, it's not, it's not always possible. But, by the way, one thing that happens as Canvas, to give you a sense of what's wrong with the Canvas view, you can say perfectly factual things and everybody laughs. And this is an experience I've had on Canvas. You go along and you say, Hamas are firing rockets at Israel, people laugh. You can say, Israel is a, Iran is a real threat to Israel, and they, they would laugh. Israel's made serious peace officers, and they would laugh. So there's a kind of bubble. Mm. The kind of campus bubble mm. that uh, that people live within. The only thing I'd say is, as long as Israel stays within the two states for two people's space, not a solution tomorrow, not without security guarantees, nothing you know fantastical. But but within that paradigm, it's a lot easier to relate to not just left wing people, but to be honest, liberals, mm. Western people generally, and so on. So so that's going to be a, a thing going forward. If Israel is perceived to vacate that space or does vacate that space for whatever reason, it's going to be much more difficult conversation. Right. Thank you very much.